our Facts Over Fear bonus session. This bonus session is intended to equip you with the tools and techniques that you need to help effectively respond to many of the myths and misconceptions that we have been addressing through this Facts Over Fear webinar series. As you know, we've done five different Facts Over Fear webinar series. The first one on the Islamophobia industry, and then we continued on with Islam and other religions, uh, Islam and peace, Islam and women's rights, and what is Sharia. And in this bonus session, what we're doing is bringing together the tools of responding to the many myths and misconceptions that you may hear, uh, whether from colleagues at work, whether from people in your church or synagogue, or whether over a Thanksgiving meal together. And what we want to do is we want to make sure you know not only the information that we've been sharing during each one of our webinar series about addressing the many myths and misconceptions that are promoted by the anti-Muslim hate industry, but we also want to give you effective tools to responding when you hear these kinds of myths and misconceptions being promoted by people around you. Because oftentimes what we have is different people who want to stand as allies with their Muslim neighbors, they unfortunately don't know how to effectively respond. Or they will give responses that in fact reinforce negative stereotypes. And we want to make sure we do not do that. There's a specific messaging approach that we have been using and promoting and sharing. We've discussed this sometimes uh, throughout the different uh, webinar series. We've, uh, Reverend Terry has been promoting that throughout the different series and explaining that. But we want to make sure we bring it all together for you in this video, this bonus video that gives sort of the overview of the whole process, the messaging approach, has the videos in one place. We'll do some role playing. Uh, we'll show you exactly how to use both the videos and uh, the tools that we're giving you in order to be effective allies. So with that background, let me go ahead and introduce myself uh, for those who may not be familiar yet. Uh, again, my name is Anila Afzali, and I am the Executive Director of the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. And I am very honored to be in this journey with all of you and my dear brother, Reverend Terry Kylo, with whom we sort of co-produce this Facts Over Fear webinar series that includes uh, both the webinar series that we've done and the five animated videos that we co-created in order to effectively respond to the many myths and misconceptions promoted by the Islamophobia industry. And I myself am sort of a, I, I tell people I'm a recovering attorney. I left my legal career in 2013 in order to address the growing divide that I was seeing in our country, the misinformation that was being promoted about Islam and Muslims. And a lot of the false information uh, was going directly against against what I myself was experiencing, especially after I had the spiritual transformation that brought me back to the faith, to my faith, and actually helped me become a better person. And I saw the beautiful transformation in my family as well with the sort of return to the faith there. So given that experience, which was in stark contrast to what I was seeing in the media, I knew we had to do something about it. And that's why I've been so honored to be in this journey, this bridge building journey with my dear brother, Reverend Terry Kyle and let me pass it over to him to introduce himself. Thank you, Anila. And it's such a an honor to be on this journey with you. And it's been such a wonderful thing to meet so many Muslims and Jews and Sikhs and Hindus and Buddhists and atheists and agnostics who are all standing together during this time of great division and refusing to be divided as human beings and as American citizens. I've been a Lutheran pastor for about 30 years. And about five to six years ago, I began to see and understand the intensity of some anti-Muslim hate in this country and began to recognize that it was being generated by intentional campaigns of dehumanization that are really well funded. And I knew as a Lutheran, uh, Luther Lutheran community having made some mistakes about how we have not always stood with people who are being marginalized or dehumanized. And also as an American and as a human being, that I had to do something about it. And so it's been a, a journey um, of learning and discovery, sometimes a painful one, but always beautiful to recognize my own humanity is, and that my own humanity is bound up with the humanity of, of all my sisters and brothers. So I'm gonna begin today with, with kind of an overview again of our messaging approach. 
And then we'll move into some of the, the scenarios and videos and topics that we want to talk with you about. So I'll share my screen. So the first thing I just want to make sure that I, that I cover again ever so briefly is that there are some real challenges that we're facing when we engage with people around messaging in one-to-one -one conversations or small groups. And the first one is, that, is fear. Fear becomes real even when the thing we fear isn't so real. Number two, that people often make decisions in their stomachs out of like moral intuitions more than they do process information and make logical connections between things. So the associations that people make with certain groups or, or certain objects or certain people um, really form a lot of these moral intuitions that people have. And so it's not always as logical as it, as it feels. Number three, that all of us as human beings prefer to be right. So we all have a certain amount of confirmation bias. We tend to reject information that challenges us, and we tend to bring in information that confirms our previously held position. And so once we have a position, it's hard to, to come off of it. Um, and then lastly, that human beings have a wonderful capacity for in-group uh, sort of unity and love, but it can also be a problem when we don't know how to respond to an out-group or when, when our fear of another outgroup overwhelms us. And so, so much of this is about coming alongside of people and helping them to see that you're part, at least in some way, of an in-group with them. And you can help bring them through the conversation kind of as a partner and not as someone who's in the opposition. Um, so the next piece I just wanna talk about is audience. And we want to remind you that, that we never really want you to try to um, convince opposition folk. Like maybe sometimes it's okay to have conversation. And you certainly don't want to spend a lot of time with unreachable unreach folks because it's just not a good use of your time. That if you're in a group setting, a small group setting, of course, what you want to try to do is respond to any questions from people that are in the opposition in a way that reaches persuadable people. So always frame your questions and your attitude around them, not necessarily directly based on the person that's asking you a question or making a statement. So some basics around messaging we want you to really focus on. Uh, the first one is that we always wanna build on shared values. And we're gonna talk about some of those shared values in just a little bit. So again, you're trying to find commonality with the person that you're speaking to. You're not trying to like get into a debate kind of scenario, but really coming alongside them with some shared values. Number, number two, you wanna share positive stories. And what this means is you don't have to understand everything about the Quran or understand everything about world history to be able to, to defend and, and get into debates about all those small facts and, and details. Like you just don't need to do that. Have some positive stories, preferably from a Muslim or a Muslim community that you know. And if not, then you can share ones that are broadly available in the news media and, and so on. Lastly, you wanna follow up the shared values and the positive stories with some information. And we'll show you at the end of this webinar today, some places you can go to get some of that positive information. So the next piece I just wanna remind you about is a change process. And first of all, change for any of us takes time. Don't expect someone in one conversation to go from being very fearful to being a full and complete authentic ally with your American Muslim neighbors. That's just not gonna happen probably. So remember that the first key is to build a, a relationship with someone, help them to understand that you care about them, that you have a lot in common. And then remember too, that as an ally, you have a lot of power. American Muslims make up around 1% of the U.S. population, uh, but the, the reality is they probably don't have the energy or the time to have 100 best friends. And so it's really important for people like you and, like you and I to be able to come alongside of uh, people and help share some of those positive stories over time. And then lastly, it's really important when you have an opportunity to build communities in which everyone can work for the common good from all kinds of diverse communities. And that really impacts people's uh, capacity to recognize that we are in this together and we can build a stronger community together uh, with one another. So now let's talk about our messaging approach. 
And this messaging approach is primarily for interpersonal conversation. We're not really trying in this webinar to get you prepared to go out and do public speaking. Although we hope this could be a building block perhaps to you do that. And the first warning here is really very simple. That we, when we talk about these messages today, we're not act, actually act, asking you to write them down, memorize them, and just repeat canned answers. That's really not what we're trying to do. So no canned beans here. Uh, just try to bring in this information and make it a part of you. Say it the way you want to say it. So when you're engaging with someone, of course, remember to consider the context. Are you in a private setting or are you in a public setting? Is it someone that you know? If it's someone with a TV camera or a recording device, be very careful because it's very easy for us to make mistakes that then get repeated and, and become a real problem. So first of all, consider the person. Um, are they genuine in their confusion um, and misinformation? Or are they trying to play gotcha? Um, how, think about how hard their fear is, how much it's a part of their identity. And then again, always try to figure out who else is listening and who the persuadable people might may be in the middle of that. The next piece, and this is a super important, is to meet the emotion, but not the myth. So help that person understand that you understand their emotion, but don't repeat the negative messages that they may be sharing in their fears. Uh, just don't repeat that stuff. So meet the emotion, understand that fear is painful, honor how they're feeling, and just be human with them and say, wow, you know, it, it's gotta be hard to be feeling that fearful, you know, of, of your neighbors. Um, and then begin to be help them understand that you can hear them, but that you also want to have a, a conversation with them. And then once you get there, try to reframe the conversation. Um, we all remember Richard Nixon and his famous I'm not a crook thing, which meant that he was associating his name himself with a crook, and that didn't help him any. And so we have to work on learning how to reframe the conversation about in a positive way about how our American Muslim neighbors are contributing to our country or around some other value that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. And then build on shared values. Listen for what they value. Think back in your, in your conversations with them over history, what has been really important to them? What kind of issues get them excited or are they passionate about? And there's all kinds of, of shared values that, that you, can, you can base a conversation on. And again, we'll talk about more of those in a minute. But, but really build on those shared values so that you have a, uh, some commonality as you move into this conversation. And then next, tell a positive humanizing story. And we just can't talk about how important this is enough because the reality is that positive story that you tell, it's not just going to have impact in the moment. That story will like stick with them and they'll keep reflecting on that story over the coming days, weeks, months, even years. And so don't underestimate the power of that. But of course, some of those stories could be perceived to be like a one-off, right? So you wanna follow that with facts and data. And there are some really great websites out there, organizations that do really good work on polling around American Muslims and the contributions they make. And we'll be giving you a list of some more of these at the end today. And then lastly, remember to share the convert, to continue the conversation with them. So don't try to get this all done in one 45 minute conversation, wearing yourself and them out. Um, you gotta pace the change here. Human beings change slowly. And lastly, it really isn't your job to change them, right? It's simply your job to engage them with who you are and, and tell those positive stories and build on those shared values. So they can you know, hopefully um, get to a place where fear is not captivating them the way it is. And then at, when the time is right, invite them to meet an American Muslim, have coffee or tea with them, invite them to go on to a, 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 a mosque or, or Islamic center visit with you. And that kind of like journey uh, can be really, really important in helping them to make the changes that they really might even be desiring to take. So thanks for listening to this. And now we're gonna get into the conversation around um, how we do messaging around specific topics. Brother Terry, can I just mention a couple points uh, before we move Please. into that? Uh, so one thing that you had in your slides that I really wanna amplify is this point that I also mentioned in the beginning, which is to not repeat the negative 
framing the negative uh, stereotypes, the negative information uh, for exactly the reason that, that you mentioned, Brother Terry. And that is when you do repeat that, psychologically what happens is those connections get reinforced in people's minds. So you would not say something like, oh no, you know, all Muslims are not the T word or something like that. Because even though you're saying it in a negative form, you in fact are reinforcing that negative stereotype. So avoid repeating negative messaging. That's that's really important. Um, and then uh, I agree with everything else you said, of course, uh, and it, it is absolutely right. Um, and and the one additional point that I was going to make uh, was around sort of continuing the conversation and inviting them in that you do want to see this as a journey. You might not be in a situation with everybody to continue the conversation, but think about the other people who might be listening in, uh, even if the person you're directly talking to might not be the one that you would continue the conversation with, there may be others who are, who will be part of the conversation. Yeah, and so and so, uh, so here are some of the messages that, that, that have been found to work. And again, I'll share my screen. The, the, first, the first one is this, that our country was founded on the principle of religion, the freedom of religion. We do not tell people how to pray and do not ban people based on their choice of religion or no religion. So this, this is a very powerful message and value that is shared by a lot of American citizens. And this really tested well. So the next one is this, no one should fear for their safety because of the color of their skin what language they speak or how they pray. We need more acceptance and love and less fear. And again, this uh, message tested by Rethink Media, tested very, very well, is we are stronger when we come together as Americans and weaker when we lack, let lack of understanding come between us. United we stand, divided we fall. Another message that people who do this work across the country find is really useful and valuable is this statement. It is wrong to apply collective blame to a community for the acts of individuals within it. And so this is a point that Anila makes really well and, and that I make, especially as a Lutheran, saying that it isn't appropriate to blame me and all Lutherans for the actions of Dylan Roof, who shot nine people at Mother Emanuel Church. And usually people can understand this and it's very helpful for them to begin to process through, well, I wouldn't like to be blamed for actions of someone else Therefore, it's not maybe right for us to be applying collective blame to any community, including the American Muslim community. So now we're going to go back to Anila just for a minute and see if she has a few things she wants to add. Sure, thank you so much, uh, Reverend Terry, for that information. I will add on your last point about that collective blame, that idea of hypocrisy, when people encounter that hypocrisy in their thinking, that actually has been shown to effectively change people's hearts and minds. So it is uh, a really good tool as well. And I would also add that going back to sort of uh, the, the approach that you discussed before earlier, uh, when you said, you know, follow the personal stories with the data, with the facts, with the information, and you provided several different sources for information, I just want to remind people that that's what our Facts Over Fear videos are for as well. You can just turn to our Facts Over Fear videos and get some of the information, some of the, uh, the gems that we try to share in those short three-minute videos uh, to use in providing some of the facts and data when you give your response. So you actually don't even need to go beyond this bonus webinar that we're doing because we're going to actually play the videos for you again. So you can just jot down certain things from the videos that you can then use as part of that sharing of data and information. Well, and just one piece, piece of research out there that's come across recently about talking about the hypocrisy issue is that, uh, is that certain members of our, of our uh, community in the United States receive uh, challenges around hypocrisy easier than others. So people that tend to be more moderate or progressive tend to be pretty good at receiving, hey, yeah, that's right, I guess I was being a hypocrite there. But the more kind of conservative folk are, the more careful you need to be about challenging people directly with, uh, with hypocrisy. So you just, you, you, wanna, you wanna really read the person and, and frame that in a way, phrase that in a way that uh, where maybe even you're talking about yourself instead of talking about the other person. So say, you know, there are times when I think I begin to apply, you know, collective blame to other groups uh, for the actions of a few individuals. You know, I don't know about you, you know, you can say, and that's an easy entry point for them to be able to consider the point without feeling accused. 
and, and a lot of this is just going to take practice and you're going to make mistakes. And we want you to know that that's okay. Because Anila and I have made a couple of mistakes in our conversations with people. Isn't that right, Anila? Absolutely. I would even say more than a couple at times. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a process. And that's, that's the important thing. Uh, and I would just repeat this point that, you know, we're all going to make mistakes. Don't be worried about being perfect. Be worried about not doing anything. Staying silent is more of a problem. And I know it's, it's worrisome for us when we don't feel fully equipped yet to go out there and actually be effective allies. But I say just practice. And it's going to take that practice to get you to a place where you're far more comfortable with it. But don't let your discomfort, don't let your sort of perceived sense of you know, lack of information prevent you from uh, speaking up. And the way that we're messaging this, the way that we're presenting the approach, you don't have to be that knowledgeable about Islam or Muslims or the Quran or anything else. You just have to know some personal stories and if you don't know any we're sharing them you know we're sharing some of these personal stories some of the stories i've shared my own experience uh or anything else there's many different places where you can get the info you need to be an effective ally even though you might not be an expert in any in any way on some of these issues yeah and sometimes the easiest approach is just to begin a conversation with you know i used to feel that way or i think differently about that y you don't have to be an expert and, and I want to tell you, friends, I have lost sleep after times when I have not been a very effective ally, but every single time it was worth it, right? Every single time it was worth it. It's worth the effort and it's worth the risk. So let's go ahead and watch our, 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 our next video, which is Islam and Peace. And then after that, Anil is going to share a few things and we'll do a little bit of a, of a practice together. Um, here we go. Islam envisions a cycle of peace, human beings at peace with the Creator and all that God has created. Islam calls on people to love their neighbors, communities to respect others, governments to foster justice for everyone. But sometimes human beings refuse God's call, or communities act in fear of others, or governments act unjustly. Every faith tradition calls us to peace and inspires us to new beginnings when we fall short. But what about those who justify their violence by their religion? A young man belonged to a faith community but was radicalized online. He wrote a manifesto, killed nine people, and wanted to inspire others to continue a cycle of violence, claiming God was on his side. Dylan Roof was a Sorry. Islam envisions a cycle of peace. Sorry, I don't, I don't know what happened there. I must have hit a mouse. So I'll, I'll do it again right now. Islam envisions a cycle of peace. Human beings at peace with the Creator and all that God has created. Islam calls on people to love their neighbors, communities to respect others, governments to foster justice for everyone. But sometimes human beings refuse God's call, or communities act in fear of others, or governments act unjustly. Every faith tradition calls us to peace and inspires us to new beginnings when we fall short. But what about those who justify their violence by their religion? A young man belonged to a faith community but was radicalized online. He wrote a manifesto, killed nine people, and wanted to inspire others to continue a cycle of violence, claiming God was on his side. Dylan Roof was a Christian. We know his terrible actions do not reflect what Jesus taught, because we know Christians. We don't trust the KKK to speak for Jesus. We should not let criminals speak for Islam. Instead, we should look to the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad and the Quran. The Prophet Muhammad said, You will not enter paradise until you believe, and you will not believe until you love each other. Shall I show you something that, if you did, you would love each other? Spread peace between yourselves. Likewise, the Quran teaches Muslims how to respond when they are harmed. The good deed and the evil deed are not equal. Repel evil by that deed which is better, and thereupon the one who is an enemy will become as though he was a devoted friend. 
the Quran further asserts a powerful message about the oneness of humanity and the mandate to do good. O humankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female, and made you into nations and tribes that ye may get to know each other, and not that ye may despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of God is the one who is the most righteous of you. Violence exists among people in all traditions. It is a human problem. Amplified in the world today because of colonialism, power dynamics, politics and foreign policies, hopelessness, loneliness, and more. The biggest threat of mass violence on U.S. soil is actually from white supremacists, and American Muslims are more likely than other faith groups to reject attacks on civilians. Islam continues to call Muslims to participate in a cycle of peace. As the Prophet Muhammad said, the best of people are those that bring most benefit to the rest of humankind. He further taught that there is a reward for serving any animate living being. Let's work together to answer this call to bring benefit to society and serve humanity together. Thank you, Reverend Terry, for sharing that video. Uh, what I just wanted to highlight real quick are some messages that work, that are effective in that video. Number one, if you notice, we call the video Islam and Peace, because again, we don't want to reinforce the negative stereotype that exists about Islam uh, in the minds of a lot of people. That's why even the name is following our approach of messaging. And you hear certain values that are emphasized through the video, like the fact that each faith tradition calls us to peace, the idea of loving neighbors, fostering justice and more. You see the example of collective blame being sort of inappropriate with the Dylan Roof example that is in that video. Uh, you get a little bit of that listening to the importance of listening to Muslims themselves and getting information from Muslims rather than uh, people who, who might have a different sort of an anti-Muslim perspective. Uh, and this comes through the words of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for example. And in fact, some of the data points, some of the stories and, and, and data points that we want to provide you through this video are included there, like the quotes from the Quran and from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, like the fact that the biggest threat on U.S. soil comes from white supremacists, something that has been uh, reinforced through various reports, including most recently uh, in just the last uh, month by the Department of Homeland Security, uh, and also the data about American Muslims and their views on violence. And the video ends with this call to action, which is sort of this continuing of the conversation of let's work together. So those are just some things that you notice in the video that highlight the approach that we're talking about. And what we're going to ask you to do on the other videos is to keep in mind those kinds of effective approaches and think about maybe even pause the video and write down some of the things that you think work in terms of effective messaging. Thank you, Anila. And so here's the scenario that we want to engage you with. Uh, Bob is a conservative independent. He served in Operation Desert Storm. He listens to both CNN and Fox News. He generally has an open mind about difficult topics and can converse with those more liberal and conservative than he is. When the topic of Islam or Muslims comes up, he is more reactive. He is concerned that Islam teaches and promotes violence and that Muslims are only playing nice to gain trust. And so Anila is going to play for a minute. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, she's going to be Bob. And then, um, but first, before we do that, we want you to like pause the video for a minute and write down a few responses that you might make to Bob. And then, uh, and then I'm going to give it a shot. Okay, welcome back. And Anila is now going to play Bob. Reverend Terry, you know, I have to say that whenever whenever this issue of Islam or Muslims comes up, I, I just get worried because I, I just think they're playing nice to try to gain our trust as Americans. And that, in fact, this is a religion that teaches violence. How can we be supportive of that? Well, you, you know, uh, you know, Bob, I, I first of all, I just want to say, you know, you know how much I value the, the service you did to our country. And I, I really value that. And I, I also value your capacity to have these kind of conversations and that you trust me enough to have, you know, conversation with me about this. And I, I, I first of all, just, just want to say that like all of us want safety. Uh, we all want safety for our families, for ourselves, for our communities and neighborhoods, and also for our countries. And I just want to tell you about a, about a friend of mine named Mohammed, who, uh, who fought in the Vietnam War. 
and was actually wounded there and has a purple heart uh, because of that. And right now he's uh, an imam at a small Islamic center. He not only is an imam, but he's a public speaker speaking out uh, to stand with people of all kinds of traditions that are that are coming under under pressure. And the other thing I appreciate about him is he's also a chaplain to the police department in his local community. So, and so, so what I want to tell you. So he might be a good example, a, you know, good person. But come on, we're talking about everybody, all the Muslims. They're they're a threat collectively, and the religion is a threat. Well, you know, Bob, um, you know, I know you as a, as a Christian person would agree that it's really important for us to say that violence against people is wrong. I mean, I know you, you believe that, Bob, you know, but um, you might be surprised to, to find out that actually um, American Muslims, you know, say that it's wrong to target civilians or to harm people who are non-combatants than even than Christians are by actually a fair amount. And so it's really, it's really amazing how sometimes the stories that we hear uh, about our American Muslim neighbors like are always you know, talking very negatively about them. But I actually have found and, and research supports the idea that American Muslims care about our nation, care about the, the peace and security of our neighborhoods, and are willing to work, you know, like my friend Muhammad, uh, to help make that happen. So I, I guess I wonder, Bob, you know, would you be at all interested sometime in maybe coming and meeting Muhammad with me? Sure, I, I'll meet him. He sounds like a good fellow. Yeah, I think you two would actually have a lot in common. Um, you both served in the military and, and he's really a great guy and tells good stories and I know you do too. Let's make it happen. All right. So, so there you saw Anila and I doing some role playing and now we invite you to just take a, a few moments and sort of compare, you know, what you wrote about how you'd respond to Bob and, and what I said. And then just, just reflect on that for a minute. And then Anila will have a few things to share about her sort of viewpoint about what I said and some additional messages that I could have used. Well, first, I just want to tell everybody that these are not practice. Like, we didn't even know what I was going to say. Terry didn't know what he was going to say. Like, we don't have a script that we follow. And as, as Terry said in the slide that he had with the beans, this is not canned answers. So we don't have canned answers. Even describing it here, uh, this is off the cuff. We're just doing it that way. So keep that in mind when you're evaluating even our responses or even our questions. So, so keep that in mind, number one. Um, number two, in terms of the, the response, there's so many, there's so much variety in what you can say. Terry did a great job identifying sort of some of the specific concerns that Bob has. And you note that even though Bob didn't ask or mention certain things in his question, because of the scenario, because of the relationship that Terry has with Bob, he was able to point out to certain things, like the fact that Bob has uh, served our country and bring that up as part of his conversation and to try to find connectedness in terms of value values uh, with sort of American Muslims and this, this person, Bob. Um, and that's really important to try to draw a bigger in-group that includes all of us and also then bring up certain facts. So you have the personal story of somebody, but as, as Bob did right away, which happens often, what people do is they like, you know, the good Muslim, bad Muslim uh, dynamic happens. They start mm -hmm. differentiating that one example you give them from the rest of the religion or the rest of the community. And you have to do a good job of not just keeping it you know, limited to this one person. Make sure people understand that this is across the board and that's where the data, the statistics about American Muslim views on violence, for instance, is helpful. Um, some additional things that could have been mentioned are the, the, the fact that the biggest threat on our soil, as, as you saw in the video, is actually from white supremacists. Uh, you could mention things like the fact that the media, the portrayal of Islam and Muslims is so negative. And we have some of that data in some of the other videos. So you can see that that media narrative portrays a certain image and creates a certain narrative that presents Muslims as a bigger threat than they actually are and, and sort of de-emphasizes the actual threat from other groups in our country. And helping bring some of those facts and information, again, you don't have to do it all, pick one or two or three or you know whatever you're comfortable with uh, and bring those up, but then tie it at the end the way Terry did, which is connected to a sort of introduction of actually getting to meet a Muslim or visit a mosque or do something like that. 
So we hope that was an example, you know, a sort of model uh, that you can use. And again, these role plays, if you asked us to do it tomorrow or once again, even, we would likely have different questions, different answers, um, and that's okay. And again, just practicing these really gets you feeling comfortable to actually give these kinds of responses or engage in this kind of way, the very same way that a lot of people are not comfortable intervening when they see an act of bullying or, you know, harassment or even a hate crime. A lot of people don't have the, the tools as a bystander to be effective and step in. And what we're trying to do is get you comfortable doing exactly that. And that's what bystander training is about as well. And that's what this, this exercise is, is about. So we really hope you do actually pause the video, try your, your hand at a response before you listen to our role play uh, moving forward with these other scenarios that we're going to do as well. Yeah, and I was just trying to model like how much I might try to get done in a very brief conversation. And, uh, you know, I think at some additional points like Anila brought up would be to, to talk about the whole collective blame here. Uh, it's not appropriate, as we said in the video, to blame all Christians for the actions of the KKK, for instance. And, and that's, some, that's certainly something that I could have brought up with Bob and that I probably would bring up at a future date. So you just kind of have to go do some practicing and give yourself the opportunity to give it a good shot in a conversation, not do too much. Um, and, then, and then remember that you can always come back to the conversation. So let's go ahead and move on now to Islam and other religions. So we'll watch the video again. And, uh, and then we will, um, we'll, we'll have you pause for a few minutes and write down any messages that you think are important there. There was a time when every tribe had what it believed was its own god. When the tribes fought, they felt that their gods fought in the heavens. But monotheism challenged the potential violence of tribalism by teaching that there is only one god, one creator of all humans, helping us to recognize the oneness of humanity. The Arabic word for god is Allah, just like in Spanish it's Dios. Muslims accept all the prophets mentioned in the Bible and believe that Muhammad was the last in that line of prophets sent by God to enhance the thriving of all on earth. The Quran embraces the teachings of God through Moses and Jesus and sees it as a unified message spoken in different contexts. Quoting the Torah, Jesus taught his followers to love God and to love neighbor. Likewise, Muhammad taught, you will not enter paradise until you believe, and you will not believe until you love each other. Human beings can choose to respond to God's commandments, but this must be a free personal choice, as God repeatedly emphasizes in the Quran. There shall be no compulsion in religion. And say the truth is from your Lord, so whoever wills, let him believe, and whoever wills, let him disbelieve. The Quran further explains, to each of you, we prescribed a law and a method. Had God willed, he would have made you into one nation, united in religion. But he intended to test you in what he has given you. So race to all that is good. To God is your return altogether, and he will then inform you concerning that over which you used to differ. Muhammad believed in religious freedom having experienced persecution on the basis of religion in Mecca. Upon becoming a community leader in Medina, Muhammad established the Medina Charter, one of the world's earliest written constitutions. That charter recognized specific rights for religious minorities. In both the charter and in the covenants made by Muhammad, Muslims were taught to respect and actively protect the rights of religious minorities. Today, some Muslim-majority countries need to do a better job of following these teachings that promote religious freedom, and there is a movement to do exactly that. Because as God teaches in the Quran, O mankind, we created you from a single pair of a male and a female, and made you into nations and tribes that you may get to know each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of God is the most righteous of you. Our efforts should focus on getting to know each other and striving to do good, as the one Creator asks of all of us. 
So now we encourage you to take just a moment and pause the video and try to capture some of the messages that you heard in that video. And then once you're done, uh, resume the video. So I'll mention that some of the messages that were effective in that video or were intentional were, uh, you know, the idea of the real purpose of monotheism as overcoming uh, tribalism and emphasizing the oneness of humanity, some specific facts and data that were provided there that can be useful to you and your responses are the fact that Muslims believe in all the prophets, including the ones mentioned in the Bible, and this idea of a unified message which emphasizes commonality. Uh, you can use many of the quotes from prophets. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Quran that were mentioned in that video. You can reference the Medina Charter and the covenants of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about protecting religious freedom. And you can emphasize the value of religious freedom and the sort of striving or struggling to do good uh, that exists in Islam, as well as other faith traditions. So now let's go ahead and, and read a scenario here. Sam is a committed Christian. She's concerned about the way religion is sometimes treated in the public square, especially Christianity. She has a pretty favorable view of the Jewish religion as her roommate in college practiced conservative Judaism. Sam has heard reports, news reports that disturb her and have led her to feel that Muslims do not respect other religions. So take just a moment here and pause the video and ask how you might respond to Sam. Welcome back. So now it's time for Anila and I to, to uh, try uh, this scenario out right now. Yeah. Terry, you know that I'm open to all faith traditions. I've had Jewish uh, roommate. Uh, I definitely have a lot of respect for Judaism and Buddhism and, and other faith traditions. But come on, Christianity is being attacked in the public square. You hear it all the time, uh, especially by sort of a lot of the liberals out there, uh, when in fact it should be Islam and Muslims that should be attacked because that's they don't respect other religions. They don't respect my religion as a Christian. Well, you know, Sam, I, I, I really uh, appreciate you bringing this conversation to me. And I, I want you to know that I agree that, that there is some anti-religious bias and bigotry uh, within, uh, within uh, the United States. And, and I really struggle with that too, sometimes. Um, I, I wanna make sure that no one feels like any, they've got to take on the religion of anybody else. And because um, it's really important in our country, uh, one of our key values is uh, religious liberty, religious freedom, uh, for each person to pray or not pray or worship or not worship as they as they choose. And and I know as an American citizen, you're really committed to that too. And so I, I respect and understand what you're talking about. But you know, one of the things about a right is that uh, if if a right is not for everyone, then it's not really a right. And so in this country, I think it's really important to stand up for the religious liberty of all people, um, including Christians but not only Christians. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I'd say as a person growing up in a small town, I once you know, kind of thought the way you did too. And then I got to know more about Muslims and uh, about Islam and, and I got to know more Muslims. And I began to realize that the very teachings in the Quran teach them that there is no compulsion in religion, that there's a strong value of respecting the religious liberties of other people. And in fact, that Muslims respect um, other traditions. And, and respect and revere all the prophets that came before the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So I just really have come to see this in a whole different way. And I've gone through kind of a transformation in my view on this. And uh, I, I know you've heard some negative messages out there and, and I certainly have too, um, but I've, I've come to see it differently. Yeah, I, I, I still doubt, I mean, just the Quran is full of a lot of passages that are just are not friendly to Jews or Christians. Well, you know, what I would say about that is, you know, Jesus, uh, you know, as you know, was quoted to say, um, I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. Yeah, but he wasn't now, talking about violence. Well, I, I know, but how would it feel to you or, or me if somebody else were to pick that phrase out of the Christian scriptures and say that Jesus was a violent revolutionary who wanted to hurt people? Um, so I think what we have to do a little bit here is, is remember that we need to learn about Muslims and Islam from Muslims and people who are qualified to respond to it. And 
I, I'd be really interested in maybe finding an imam with you. Um, and you and I could both ask some of these questions of them and, and see how they interpret the Quran and make sure that we're hearing uh, scripture that was written 1400 years ago in a way that, that really fits what it was intended to say. Yeah, I, I don't know about that. We'll, we'll see. Well, we can talk about that later. And I, I just I just want, want to say I appreciate the conversation. And how about that Seahawks game on Sunday? Yes. 5-0, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so that last little bit there that I did, um, I, I just want to say, don't let the conversation stick on this the whole time. Like, just, just don't do it. Because then it feels like you're rushing or that you're anxious about it. So feel free to move out of this conversation when you're talking to people, too because you don't want your whole relationship to be about this. You want it to be about lots of things. Okay, now, now just, just take a moment and kind of think about, uh, kind of compare the way you wanted to respond uh, to Sam and the way I did. And then we'll come back and listen to Anila uh, give us some, some of her insights about how I responded and what other things I could say. So pause the video now. Okay, welcome back. And Anila, you know, what other things, messages do you think I could have shared during that conversation? Yeah, that, that conversation, it's, it's always tough when you have somebody who is sort of hesitant or resistant to sort of changing their perspective. Uh, but I think there would have been really helpful to bring up some verses from the Quran, for instance, that really talk about uh, Jews and Christians in the positive light the way that it is in the Quran. Uh, mentioning something like the fact that Jews and Christians uh, are described as people of the book, which is an honorific title uh, that is accorded to Jews and Christians, and identifying some of the similarities uh, 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 between Judaism, uh, Christianity, and Islam as part of the Abrahamic mm -hmm. faith traditions. So I think yeah. that could have helped address some of that very strong negative view that Sam seemed to have uh, about Islam being somehow different uh, and, and wholly sort of um, out there separate from Judaism and Christianity. So maybe tying that loop together uh, and uh, sort of emphasizing again, uh, which Terry did, which is uh, our shared American value of religious freedom and how that really has to be for all. I think that was really effective uh, and emphasizing that along with some specific passages uh, from the Quran or from Prophet Muhammad's example uh, might have been useful in this scenario. Yeah, I was feeling, uh, you know, because of the kind of the resistance, Anila, mm -hmm. I was feeling that kind of less was more in that situation. Okay. And because there was a lot of energy around it, I, I wanted to, to tie together around some common values around American religious liberty and that sort of thing and sort of say enough but then, you know, leave room for more in the future because, you know, sometimes people, if you're, if they're really resistant, you, you share everything, you know, and all of a sudden you've like, you've like shared it all and, and they've, they've said no to each one. Mm. And so I sort of made a strategic choice in that conversation, uh, noticing the resistance to sort of keep it simple and hope for a follow on conversation later, but mm. it's so hard to know <laughs> what to do. Yep. Exactly. Um, another message that uh, that you had shared as part of your messaging uh, guidance that could have been really useful here too uh, is the messaging about you know in, in our country we do not tell people how to pray uh, and emphasizing that point too. Uh, but yeah. but you did mention the religious freedom and I certainly understand what you're saying about keeping it simple and okay. that's a decision that each of us makes each time. Uh, again, that's hopefully right. this highlights the diversity in responses that exist and can be used. Uh, but but the point is to say something again, not 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 to remain silent, not to allow uh, somebody to get away with making sort of um, you know untrue statements or statements that promote a narrative that divides us. That's that's really the point here. And I know we're posing these as actual questions people ask. Sometimes they might not be questions; they just might be comments uh, that you hear somebody make, and you can step in the same way, you know, and just say, "Hey, I heard you say this," uh, or you know, "Hey, I I heard what you just said." If we don't want to repeat the negative. Negative, negative messaging that they just said, say, hey, I heard what you just said. Uh, I just wanted to share something, you know, uh, play in that way. Or if it's on social media, it would be a very different approach. But again, keeping in mind that we do not want to repeat the negative messaging. We want to try to use personal stories or personal connections. We want to try to uh, sort of identify shared values. Um, and we want to share some facts and information. So it goes beyond just the one individual example or story uh, to apply across the board uh, to the entire group.
So those are just some some tips. Yeah. Yeah, and the last thing I would say is, is as, as it's going to happen every single one of these, you can see Anila and I kind of going back and forth about what was effective and what could have been better. And like that is, that's called learning. Um, that's very important to do. And whenever I'm engaging with American Muslims in a conversation like this, I always try to ask the question, how did I disadvantage you in that conversation? because we have to keep learning. And so there is a, a, a self critique and evaluation phase that comes in, in engaging in these conversations. Don't be afraid of that, learn from it, and then, uh, and then you know, see how you do next time. So let's go ahead and move on to our next, uh, next topic, which is Islam and women's rights. What does Islam teach about women's rights? There is a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to this topic. So thank you for asking this question. Did you know that Islam granted a package of women's rights 1400 years ago that was unparalleled for over a thousand years in other parts of the world? Prophet Muhammad taught his followers that the best of them were those who treated women well. He further described men and women as committed partners and helpers to each other, and he himself sought the advice and counsel of women and even appointed women to positions of power, like Shafa bin Abdullah, who he appointed as supervisor of the market or minister of finance. As a result of Islamic teachings, Muslim women were in the marketplace, in the medical field, in positions of scholarship, and more. Muhammad even told his followers, women and men, to learn from his wife, Aisha. And there have been thousands of other great female Muslim scholars and jurists throughout history. In fact, the first university in the world was even built by a Muslim woman in the year 859. Muslim women are surgeons, entrepreneurs, politicians, teachers, lawyers, and more. American Muslim women are the second most highly educated religious community in our country. Like me, I'm a Harvard Law School educated attorney who made partner at a law firm and served as general counsel before leaving my legal career to pursue service. There are American Muslim women like Ibtihaj Muhammad and Dalila Muhammad who have brought home Olympic medals for Team USA. There are American Muslim women who are in Congress now, like Representatives Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. And even outside the U.S., several Muslim-majority countries have even had female heads of state, like Sheikh Hasina, who is the longest-serving prime minister in Bangladesh. Unfortunately, in many parts of the world and even here in our own country, women have faced and continue to face oppression and misogyny. In Muslim-majority countries, such injustice is not because of Islamic teachings, but rather despite Islamic teachings that sought to liberate and empower women, as well as all of humanity. Such injustice is because of power dynamics, poverty, warfare, colonialism, post-colonialism, lack of education, bad translations, and more. We agree that women's rights should be upheld, so let's work together to combat misogyny and the patriarchy, but without attacking and demonizing the religion of over 1.7 billion people in the world, especially when that religion could actually help uplift and empower women as it has done and continues to do. So we encourage you just to take a few minutes, pause the video and ask yourself what messages in the video do you think you'd like to remember to be able to share? Okay, welcome back. And now we're going to read a scenario. And then this time I'm going to ask Anila a question. Fred considers herself a progressive Democrat. She's an elementary school teacher and the parent of a daughter and a son. She is part of a book club and has done some advocacy work for women's rights. Through media and late night comedians like Bill Maher, she has heard that Islam teaches the oppression of women. Fred thinks that the hijab is a sign of this oppression and so does not act or speak out to support Muslims. So Anila, my name is Fred and you know we've known each other for a while and I just gotta tell you, I mean, I've heard so many bad things about Islam with respect to women's rights. I mean, I, I just don't know if I can be supportive. 
Well, first off, uh, Fred, uh, thank you for bringing this to my attention directly. Uh, I, I appreciate you caring about women's rights. Uh, it's a value that I share myself as well. I know you've done some advocacy work for women. Uh, I have as well in my work uh, from college all the way to now. And I know you know about some of the work that I've done as well. So uh, women's rights is something that we can agree on. Uh, and I will say that for me as a Muslim woman, uh, in fact, I'm driven to advocate for women because of my faith tradition. Uh, I chose Islam for myself because of the liberation of women, uh, despite what you might see or hear on media and from some late night comedians uh, that unfortunately portray Islam and especially on this issue of women's rights in a really ugly way uh, that is actually not aligned with reality. Uh, when you look at the examples of American Muslim women themselves or Muslim women throughout history, whether they played the role of scholars, whether they played the role of teachers, educators, uh, judges, or more, whether they've been the heads of state. You know, there are over a dozen Muslim majority countries that have had female heads of state. Uh, the, if you even go back to the, the very beginning of Islam, where it introduced a package of women's rights that was unheard of then and for many generations and centuries to come. Uh, there are so many examples, but I would say the most important thing, Fred, is to listen to actual American Muslim women themselves or Muslim women themselves themselves rather than getting your information uh, from a place that might not portray uh, the reality of the situation. Uh, you've known me. I, I hope you understand how I am not quiet, how I am not sort of a lot of the negative stereotypes people have about American Muslim women or Muslim women generally. Uh, and I hope you can understand that that's actually true for Muslim women across the board. Uh, that I, I hope you get the chance to actually talk and meet more Muslim women uh, to help that shape your perspective, especially since I know you care about women's rights like I do, like Muslim women do. I know you care about religious freedom in our country uh, and making sure that we don't tell women how to dress. Whether somebody chooses to wear a, you know, a burqa or a bikini, it should be up to that individual woman. You know, you and I, I, I hope, agree on a woman's choice. And upholding that choice includes allowing me to choose to wear a head covering or not in our country founded on religious freedom. Yeah, but, you know, so, Anila, I mean, I, I respect that, you know, and, but I, I, I've heard so much about, like, women not being able to drive until recently in some other countries or and women being forced, you know, to wear a hijab or a burqa or, or you know, whatever. And I'm just really, really concerned about that, you know, like, you know, like, why do you wear that hijab? Like, I don't understand um, I, all these different things I hear about in the media. And then I hear what you're telling me and I, I can't put the two together. Fair enough. Uh, I definitely appreciate where you're coming from, again, from a concern, a shared value of women's rights and upholding sort of justice for all. So again, I share that with you. And the examples that you can give that we often see in the media, uh, like the one you gave about driving, you know, you have to keep in mind that there are over 50 Muslim majority countries in the world. Uh, and it's not fair to pick one example and identify that as reflective of uh, the Muslim majority countries or Islam, when in fact it is not. You know, the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there are women who rode camels, which I will tell you is a lot harder than driving a car. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, the reason that I choose to wear a head covering, uh, and it is an individual choice, it has to be an individual choice because Islam is clear about the, the fact that there can be no compulsion in religion. You cannot force people uh, to wear a head covering, to pray, uh, to even be a Muslim. There has to be individual choice. And the places that restrict that or do not allow for that uh, individual choice to be made, I would stand with you and sort of, um, you know, speak out against that kind of injustice because it is an injustice. But that injustice is not because of the religious teaching. It is because of a lot of other political uh, and, and personal uh, issues that come into play, often cultural issues and, and more. So keep that in mind, power dynamics. We know how the patriarchy works and misogyny, unfortunately, those apply. But if you ask women uh, why they choose to wear the head covering, and in our country, about half of American Muslim women choose to wear the head covering, half do not. None of my siblings do. I started wearing my head covering, not because of a religious obligation, actually. Uh, I, I started wearing it because the more I learned about Islam, the more proud I was to be, an Amer to, to be a Muslim. And I thought, why wouldn't I want to represent my identity the very same way that, you know, I'm a proud Seahawk fan. So I'm all decked out in my number 12 attire uh, on, uh, on you know, Seahawk Sundays. Uh, and you've seen me in that as well. So it's the very same way. And it's a constant reminder to me of God. It's a way to 
show modesty. And it's a way to sort of help me bring the divine into my mundane everyday existence and reminds me that I have to hold myself to a higher standard, that I have to do what Islam teaches, including things like showing forgiveness and kindness to the person who drives by, rolls down their window and yells obscenities at me. That's what this hijab does. It's like my superwoman cape or, you know, something like that. But different that's, women, that's great choose, yeah, I was just going to say different women choose to wear it for different reasons, but the, you know, mostly it's, it's a sign of religious devotion and modesty and identity. Well, we'll keep, we'll keep talking Anila. We'll keep talking about it. Yes, I, I invite you again to come meet some of my Muslim female friends. I think your perspective might change on sort of who Muslim women are when you actually meet more and engage with them directly instead of just listening to, to what the media presents. Because you and I also know that the media is not always the best, most accurate source of information, particularly when it comes to marginalized communities and the representation, whether it's Black, Indigenous, people of color, immigrants, refugees, Muslims, or more. All right, so everybody take just a moment and pause the video and think about how Anila answered and compare that to how you thought, you know, to answer Sam. And then come back when you're done with that reflection and we'll just share a few more things that messages that can be shared. Okay, welcome back everyone. So Anila, I thought, you know, you answered the, the question beautifully and, you know, some additional, you know, pieces that I thought would be important for like another conversation perhaps is that, uh, according to the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, which will which will give you uh, the website to later, they they find that that less than one percent of American Muslim women wear the hijab because they feel any any sense of obligation to their family. Most wear it just because they want to, and and a lot of American Muslim women do not wear hijab as well. It's just important for people to be able to see that kind of diversity. Um, as an example, that American Muslims are not a monolith, which is what we tend to do with communities that we're fearful about. Yep, those, those are great points, Terry. I, I agree. Uh, I'd always I'd also be curious for you as a non-Muslim, how you would respond, as, you know, just some points that you might also bring up uh, as a non-Muslim answering that, and, and as a man answering that question. Yeah, so one of the first things I, I do when I'm asked that question is, is I, I talk about, you um, the, the package of women's rights that Islam ushered into existence in, in, uh, in, in, in Arabia at that point, um, about women being able to divorce, uh, to marry, to be able to um, hold own, own property. Um, and, and so what, what was really happening during that time was Islam was teaching that uh, how to correct the imbalance between the centuries old patriarchy where men were able to generate wealth and where, where women weren't as much. And uh, that the Prophet Muhammad's wife uh, was a, a wealthy merchant and actually asked him to marry her. Um, and how he had women in, in, uh, in respected positions of authority and in, in within you know, his own leadership. Um, so those are some of the pieces that I like to lift up um, to help people recognize that, that uh, that, that, that Islam was really about equalizing, recognizing the equality of men and women and in, in doing so in very practical ways. And that in fact, the Prophet Muhammad took a lot of heat from some people who didn't like the change or thought he was going too far. And he was willing uh, as many other religious leaders have, as in fact, Jesus had did in terms of taking some heat from people who thought that, uh, that, he, was, that he was giving women uh, too much uh, authority and credit within his own community. Those are some great points. Uh, and for our audience, hopefully they can pick up on some of those as well and incorporate them into their answers. Uh, and also personal stories of Muslim women you may know. Hopefully uh, everybody does know a Muslim woman. If not, now you know me. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> you can share my story. You can share other stories. Uh, and uh, please look for opportunities to meet more Muslims in general, men and women, uh, so that you can build on some of those personal interactions and stories uh, that you might be able to share. I I will also point out one thing that th in this one in particular, when it comes to women's issues, there is a lot of cultural baggage that is brought into the religion. Uh, so you 
you might encounter individuals in your experience who don't align with what I'm saying or with what Terry is saying or what our video is saying or even what the statistics from ISPU and other places are, are stating. And if that's the case, please know that there, again, is a lot of diversity, that Muslims are not a monolith. So not every Muslim you're going to meet is going to fit within what we're talking about um, and find the positive stories to share. Uh, it is not going to help if you are trying to stand as an ally to share you know, the, the one-off bad experience that you might have had with an individual Muslim man or woman. Um, that, I'm not taking away from the reality that that might exist. Hopefully not, but you know it might exist. Um, however, uh, keep in mind the purpose for your conversation. If you are trying to stand as an ally to help counter the anti-Muslim sentiment that is literally resulting in people like me facing harassment, bigotry, attacks even, and then people literally being killed even uh, because of their religious identity, uh, then know that in that context, it's the personal positive stories that are going to make a difference, not the negative one-offs uh, that you could potentially experience or share. Yeah, you know, and, and something else, like for those of you who, who may be uh, coming from a Christian background or, or from any other community, um, share in those contexts when it's appropriate, the ways in which your own community has perhaps fallen short of recognizing the power and worth and value of, of women. And, and so what I like, one story I like to do is to, is to share about Jesus when Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. And in that century uh, in Palestine, what that meant was that she was being accepted as an official disciple of Jesus, who would then later on be able to be a rabbi operating in the public square of theology. And uh, so um, when Martha comes out of the kitchen, she's concerned that Mary and Jesus are going to get in big trouble and maybe even be in mortal danger at that point. And, and Jesus is saying, no, wait a minute, I'm willing to risk my life for this. And then what has happened within Christianity, of course, is that that, that teaching of Jesus, that willingness of Jesus to risk himself for women was kind of forgotten for a long time so that we didn't even have female uh, pastors until like, you know, not very long ago really historically. So it's important to, to take those teachings of take the log out of your own eye before you complain about the speck in someone else's. And that again is kind of a, of a countering hypocrisy kind of argument. So let's, let's move on to, the, uh, to, the, to our, our last um, video, which is gonna be on what is Sharia. Sharia is simply an Arabic term that refers to Islamic teachings. These include things like praying five times a day, fasting, giving in charity, being kind to parents, forgiving those who do you wrong, loving your neighbor, standing for truth and justice, similar to teachings of other faith traditions. Unfortunately, there are a lot of conspiracy theories on the internet by anti-Muslim hate groups about Islam and Muslims. Contrary to the misinformation campaign by the multi-million dollar Islamophobia industry, the reality is that Islam is one of the world's major religions and shares many values with Judaism and Christianity. As one of the three Abrahamic faiths, Islam teaches similar stories to the Bible, including about Adam and Eve, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Muslims further believe in all the prophets and believe prophets were sent to teach us the same essential message, to love and worship the one true God and to love and do good to God's creation. Islam further teaches similar basic values of compassion, mercy, justice, and charity, like other faith traditions. Linguistically, Sharia means a path that leads to water. The idea is that just as a thirsty animal seeks a path to water, we as human beings are spiritually thirsty, and Sharia provides a path toward fulfilling our spiritual thirst as human beings. Islamic teachings include the command to follow the laws of the land in which you live. So here in our country, it would include upholding the U.S. Constitution, the supreme law of our land. In our country, one of the values we cherish as Americans is religious freedom. Those who seek to ban Sharia are in fact seeking to ban Islamic teachings, which strips American Muslims of their right to practice their faith. Singling out and seeking to prohibit a minority group from practicing their religion is un-American, unconstitutional, and immoral. 
Such attacks on our fundamental constitutional values jeopardize the freedom of all Americans. The best way to protect the religious freedom of all Americans is to uphold and preserve the right of each to freely practice their faith, just as the First Amendment mandates. So let's stand united as Americans against attacks on the rights and freedoms of any group, including American Muslims. Okay, so now we encourage you just to pause the video for a minute, take a few minutes and write down some of the messages in that video, maybe even go back and review it one more time if you want to, that you think might, might be helpful to you, and then we'll move on with our scenario. Okay, welcome, welcome back. And uh, and we're gonna have Anila read this this scenario. Uh, actually, sorry, Terry, before we do that, can I just highlight some things from the video? Oh, sure, I'm sorry. That's okay, yeah. So okay, we'll just kind of, no, that's okay. We'll, we'll start again from the welcome back. I'll go ahead and start there. Yeah, Sharia is simply- we just finished this. Okay. okay, go ahead, Anila. So welcome back. Some of the specific messages in this video, you'll notice, you know, even with starting with a definition and some examples that counter the misinformation, the stereotype that people often have when they think of this word that is a foreign word uh, that is exploited and abused by the anti-Muslim hate industry to really paint a negative picture. So this video tries to uh, counter that with presenting some actual uh, examples of Islamic teachings uh, and put that in a context that people can understand. And something that's important in this video is talking about what Islam is rather than what it's not. The Islamophobia industry wants to keep sort of Muslims and allies to be talking constantly on the defense, right, defending Islam and all of these things that they're putting out there instead of actually talking about what it is, which is one of the world's largest religions, that it is part of the Abrahamic faith traditions, uh, that there are these commonalities with other faith traditions, including the teaching and value of loving and worshiping the one true God and loving and, and serving his creation, uh, the values of compassion, mercy, justice, and charity, and also the important point that exists in Sharia, in Islamic teachings, of upholding the law of the land in which you live. So here in our country, it would be the U.S. Constitution, which also has specifically this value of religious freedom, our First Amendment values that we all want to uphold together, and connecting that to the sort of movement to ban Sharia, which really is an affront to all of us as Americans, and we need to stand united to counter that. And now thank we can you. go ahead to our scenario. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Anila. So so uh, our, this scenario is Joe has not met many people of other faith traditions, but feels the people deserve the right to worship or not as they desire. He's heard that some states have passed laws to, quote, keep Sharia from taking over the United States. Joe is not sure what to make of that, but figures that states would not be passing laws if it were not a problem. So I'm gonna be Joe, and I'm gonna ask you this question, uh, Terry, as, as my friend. Um, you know, Terry, I've been hearing a lot about this like creeping Sharia and the concerns with it. And some states have even passed laws, I, I heard, uh, banning it. So it seems like there must be some serious problem with this. I know you work with a lot of Muslims, so I was just curious what your thoughts are on this, because to me, it's like, why would states be passing this as legislation if it actually wasn't a serious problem? So it must be a serious problem, right? Well, you know, Joe, I really appreciate the question. And, and you know, you and I have talked before about about how you know we need to stand up for everybody's religious liberty mm -hmm. in the country, and and I just want you to you know again know that that's that's really where I'm I'm coming from when I'm working and standing with Muslims. Um, it's a lot of it's because of that. Because if we reduce the rights for one group, you know all groups are going to be be threatened by by a reduction in rights later on. And I, I just want to say that that um, that you know Islam Sharia is really very simple. It's it's just Islamic teachings. You know, like love the one creator of all humankind so we can recognize all he people as human. Loving your neighbor as you love yourself, doing good to the creation, honoring your parents, making sure your neighbors have food. Um, all of those are sort of parts of, of, of a vast kind of set of teachings that, that our Muslim neighbors call Sharia. And it really is very sim similar to Jewish teachings of the Halakha, very similar to, to the body of Christian teachings. And uh, that, that help you know Christians and Jews and Muslims understand like 
how do we like live in this world? And, uh, but I, I'll tell you something's been happening that really is disturbing me. And that is that some of the hate groups out there have been, have even written model legislation uh, to try to essentially uh, get people become more fearful about Islam. They've written this model legislation and a very few uh, number of states, about 14 states, and, uh, and a very few number of legislators in those states have been pushing this essentially to really gin up fear against our American Muslim neighbors. So really what's happening in these states doesn't really make any sense and here's why. Um, because the US Constitution is the law of the land. And what this bill basically does is it reaffirms that the US Constitution is the law of the land, which is like, well, duh, like, of course it is. But what the people who are ginning up fear around this do is um, they, they basically don't represent what Sharia is honestly or faithfully at all. And in fact, they leave out that part of Sharia is obeying the law of the land in which we live. And in this country, what is that? Well, it's the US Constitution and all the laws that flow from it. And actually, Muslims in this country have a very high uh, identification of uh, approval for the U.S. Constitution because it lifts up something that's really valuable to Muslims, which is religious freedom. Mm -hmm. And so I, I just I think that one of the things that'd be really exciting for maybe you and I to do is to learn more about Sharia, not from these hate groups. You know, they just want to divide us all the time, but to learn more about it from Muslims themselves. And I'd be really curious if you'd come with me and and try to ask some of these questions of, of an imam that I know. Oh yeah, I would absolutely be interested in something like that. I'm always open to learning more, uh, but bottom line, I, I shouldn't be scared about Sharia then? I, I think that people are trying to make us afraid. I oh. think people out there in these anti-Muslim hate groups, you know, are trying to, trying to divide us and, and make us fearful, um, but they really don't provide any good information about 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 Sharia and, and bas the basic set of Islamic teachings that it that it represents, and um, I just think well, you know we shouldn't we, sh we shouldn't be afraid of people just because somebody else is, tells us to. Well, why are they doing this? Why are they trying to make us scared? Well, you know that's that's complicated. You know, but my my own feeling uh, is, and what some of my research indicates, is that a lot of these groups, um, what they really want is to have us so fearful. That, that they can rope us into a bunch of military spending that even our military doesn't really want or need. Mm, interesting. Okay, thank you. Thanks for clarifying and answering my, my question. Thanks, Joe. So, so we encourage all of you just to pause the video for a minute and kind of compare, you know, what did I say? What did, what did you write down? And then we'll, we'll take a few minutes and, and have Anila and I have a conversation about what I said and what, what other, other options uh, for that conversation. Okay, welcome back everybody. So Anila, what are some other things that I could have said or any critique uh, for me about, about how I responded to that? Yeah, I thought you did a great job responding to the question and addressing the fear, but also making sure that the concern is seen as sort of this manufactured concern rather than an actual concern, uh, which is the reality of it. Um, some additional things that you could mention, and I'm just sharing this more for people to know and potentially consider in their responses. Uh, number one, the American Bar Association uh, even came out at the time that this movement, this anti-Sharia movement was really growing uh, to, to point out that this is basically just manufacturing fear, that there is no reason to have these kinds of bills, that the very point of them are unnecessary, as you mentioned, because the Constitution already is the supreme law of the land. So that's number one. Uh, number two is to mention the fact that the, the model, the guy behind this movement, the, the guy who came up with the model legislation, that he also even admitted uh, that he didn't just want these passed because that would defeat the purpose. Uh, it wasn't a, the, the fact of getting something passed because it was needed or because the protection is necessary, but rather he wanted to get people talking about this. He wanted to sort of gin up the kind of fear that you're describing. So uh, that's that's another uh, point to be able to make. Um, the, the third point that I would really emphasize, and this is one that I would uh, think is critical, is helping people understand that by saying that you are either going to ban Sharia or, or are against Sharia, that what you're actually saying is you are against Muslims practicing their religious and uh, their religion in our country, which is based on religious freedom. 
and that messaging point about we don't tell people how to pray in our country, right? That, that that's something that should be left up to individuals as part of the beautiful freedoms that we enjoy in our country. Uh, and we should be able to unite on that value of religious freedom, that shared American value, but really helping them understand that, that that's what it is when you say you're against Sharia. And I emphasize that point because, for example, when there were these um, rallies organized by one of the largest uh, anti-Muslim hate groups in our country, Act for America, there were rallies organized in various cities, including here in Seattle. And there were a lot of people who came uh, to counter protest the haters, which was great. We had a beautiful solidarity of people from all diverse backgrounds come together and stand against that kind of hate. But one of the things that I noticed is many of our allies who were there standing in solidarity with Muslims, they themselves either didn't know what Sharia was or would make statements like, well, I'm against Sharia, but I support Muslims. Well, you can't make that statement because it's kind of like saying, you know, I'm against Christians practicing their religion or I'm against Christian teachings, but I support Christians. You're actually not supporting their religious identity. You're actually not supporting their religious freedom. You're not supporting their religious right if you are saying that you're against them in that kind of way. So the more proper response would be to say that I support Muslims and their religious freedom to practice their faith as they see fit. And as long as that does not conflict in any way with the U.S. Constitution, then that is allowed in our country. And that's the reality of it, that no court would allow any foreign law to apply in place of our U.S. Constitution and the consideration of any foreign law, whether it's Jewish halakha law, as you mentioned, whether it's uh, Sharia, whether it's, you know, any kind of foreign law, it has to go through a test by the courts where they ensure that it does not violate public policy, that it does not violate the Constitution. So I think that would be something that I would want our allies in particular to understand, because I saw many videos of people asking allies you know, these kinds of questions, and they were making statements that uh, showed that they did not have a clear understanding of Sharia, um, and they were saying things that were actually negative to their Muslim neighbors. Yeah, I totally agree, and I, I think uh, that um, essentially this whole movement around uh, these anti-Muslim laws or anti-foreign uh, foreign law bills across the states is really an attempt at manipulation, right? So you have you have a lot of people who don't know much, who have some fear of American Muslims. And then when these bills gets, get passed, then they think, oh my goodness, my fear is real because the, the, the state legislatures are, are taking this seriously. And I think it's really important for us to, to, to learn about this. Like one of the examples, I mean, I've asked some of these hate group members, you know, well, give me an example of, of, of Sharia like taking over. And like one of the only examples they have is that is that in some swimming pools, in Minnesota, there's a women's only night. Uh, you know, as, as if that, like, that's some kind of, like, as if women wouldn't sometimes like to be the only ones in the pool. People <laughs> who have experienced various kinds of challenges with men. So um, that's a pretty weak example. Um, and the other example Anila mentioned was that sometimes Muslims, like, go to kind of get, have their divorce arbitrated by an imam. Um, under the, the the broad terms of Sharia, but of course that's all overseen by a court, as Anila said, um, and and other people can do that too. Christians can do that, Jews can do that, other people of other faiths can do that as well. Mediation is very common in these cases, and yeah. so people sort of take you know what, all that we don't know. And here's the last thing: is that they actually used, as I've said before, messaging studies to put the word Sharia and the word law together. The word law is kind of a scary word, you know, it reminds you of the police car behind you. And they found that that, that that putting those two words together really kind of scares American citizens. And so we have to do our best to, to not be, not to fall into that game and not to allow ourselves or other people to be manipulated that way. Exactly. And I would just point out on the example you gave, uh, that community pool example, which is actually the only one I've heard as well, uh, in that specific example, that those women's only nights or times are not just for Muslims. Uh, a lot of different women of all faith and no faith backgrounds actually use and enjoy and benefit from those kinds of times that are dedicated to women only. So. Yeah. So so uh, the, the next piece we just want to share is just, this is very, very brief and because we're nearing the end of our video here is, you know, what if you're part of a, a church or a synagogue or a community group or some kind of community, what can you do, uh, you know, within that community to sort of help? And what we really encourage is to gather together with people of whatever religious traditions or community groups are around that are willing to come and get to know each other and share stories about, about the relationships that you build. And I really encourage to, to keep it really simple. 
Um, so once a year, get together, eat, share stories, maybe have some games uh, for the kids. This is you know when we can get back together again, or even have Zoom conversations uh, between different communities so they can get to know each other and share those stories. Number two, um, once a year, get together and do some kind of community project uh, to benefit the community and then tell stories about that. And, and then the third one is to be public together. So if there's a parade, march in the parade. If there's a community food gathering, you know, in the park, show up there together. Um, but keep it simple. You don't have to make this like the focus of everything. But the more people can see people of diverse traditions coming together, believing deeply in their tradition, but also recognizing and respecting the validity of the other traditions, like that's so powerful. And stories get told out of that that help begin to, to shape a very different narrative about how we can relate to each other. We also just want to share with you uh, very, very quickly, just a few resources um, so that um, you, can, uh, you can use them in your own research. Uh, so first of all, we just want you all to know that, that you can connect with us uh, at Facebook at our Facts for a Fear campaign on Anila's uh, organization's uh, Facebook. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter at factsforafear.org. And we also have a lot of resources that paths to understanding, including a lot of resources on our YouTube channel, which you can also check out. We also want you to know that the Shoulder to Shoulder campaign is it also has now webinar uh, kind of trainings that kind of take you to uh, then maybe the next level in preparing you to, to be able to speak about uh, and respond to anti-Muslim bigotry. And so you can find out more about that at the Shoulder to Shoulder Campaign's website, which is listed above. And then just some trusted sources. The Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, we use those, uh, their, their reports, their you know, really scholarly, you know, believable reports all the time. Of course, I've mentioned Shoulder to Shoulder campaign. You can also go to IslamFactCheck.org and you can you, you can, uh, have other people go there as well. Learn more about the Islamophobia Network um, at IslamophobiaNetwork.com. And then some other ones that are really fun to learn about. Uh, LetterToBaghdadi.com is a response of Muslim scholars to some people who claim uh, to, you, to justify their violent behavior uh, by Islam. And, uh, and, and these scholars just take that, those arguments apart. Uh, commonword.com, again, very important kind of collaborative website between Christians and Muslims and all that we hold in common. And then lastly, a beautiful uh, story of the covenants of the prophet, which are um, some of the agreements that the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made with people who were Christian and Jewish to make sure that they were gonna be, uh, be protected and have their own religious freedom. So we just want you to know about those resources. And we're just so thankful you've that you're, you're joining with us uh, in all of these. And, and Anila, what would you like to share about what individuals can do? You're muted, sorry. Uh, yeah, I wanna start just by mentioning the important power that each one of us has as individuals that do not allow the fact that there's this whole industry with millions upon millions of dollars that they're using every year to promote a certain negative narrative about Islam and Muslims or about you know seeking to divide us in general. Don't allow that to sort of uh, make you think that you're weak or that you don't have the power and capacity to truly make a real difference because you do. Every single one of us has that, uh, that power, that ability, um, and, and the privilege even, and I would say even the responsibility to do something because it's us that have to be the ones who speak out. And the few things that I would add on a personal level that every single person can do. Number one, you know, this is connected to what you were saying, Terry, which is really learning uh, more about sort of Islam and Muslims. And something that I would mention is that there's actually statistical information showing that the more somebody knows about Islam, um, that they actually, like when they actually learn a little bit about Islam, that their fear decreases. Because again, there's all this misinformation being promoted. And if you actually learn the reality, you're like, oh, this is like other faith traditions. Uh, so that decreases the fear, as does the, the important connection, the personal relationships with actual Muslims. That is critical. And some of the places that you can go to, you know, if you want to read from non-Muslim uh, sources, you can go to somebody like Karen Armstrong, uh, who was a Catholic, Catholic nun, uh, who wrote some great, uh, who has written some great books on Islam. 
Islam, um, uh, including one entitled Islam. Another one I believe is called uh, Prophet for Our Times about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And learning about Prophet Muhammad itself can be uh, really critical in understanding a lot of the context and background about Islam too. There are also many Muslim speakers and authors and, and others that you can follow or read or learn from, um, including Omar Suleiman, who's a sheikh down in uh, Texas, uh, and he's very uh, sort of active in the justice front as well. So he's a great source of inspiration. Uh, Tariq Ramadan, uh, Ibtihaj Muhammad, who's the Olympic uh, uh, medalist uh, for Team USA, uh, Dr. Sherman Jackson, uh, Yasmin Magahed, who writes about Islam very much from a spiritual perspective. So those are just some additional names uh, that I would mention. Um, the other thing that I would mention too is the importance of call, um, sort of, you know, making sure you engage when you see uh, misinformation, lies being promoted, when you see this sort of stuff, whether again in person or uh, the place we see it more often now, which is social media. And the tip that I have for people on social media is do not try to get into arguments or debates or attack people or call them bigots and Islamophobes and racists. That is not helpful. That actually helps them further dig in their heels and it does not help anybody. It probably increases your stress level uh, and your sort of outrage and everything else. Instead of doing any of that, all you got to do is go to any story, you'll see all the negative comments uh, about it, when it, it doesn't matter what the story is on, it could be about, you know, Muslims feeding the homeless, and you're going to have all of this negative commentary by sort of anti-Muslim bigots, but all you got to do is ignore the haters, entirely ignore the haters, just upvote by, you know, liking or uh, clicking sort of anything to show uh, positive re reaction uh, to the to the positive messages. The positive messages that people make on that uplift those by just liking them and then share positive stats, information, data, personal stories. Don't even say anything to the haters. Ignore them entirely because when you engage with them, you actually uplift those and amplify those negative messages. And again, our approach is to not amplify negative messaging. Ignore that entirely. Uplift, promote, and state positive messages share personal stories, use some of the stats and the data from the reports from ISPU um, and other places, um, share different people that uh, folks can follow, you know, some of the speakers that I mentioned. Uh, that is a far better way to respond to the sort of negative information that exists on, on social media or otherwise. And finally, the point that I will make is that we all have a platform whether it's our church network, whether it's our work colleagues, whether it's, you know, wherever it may be, whether it's our own family, we all have our networks that we can reach. And I will say that many of you have people in your network that would never, ever talk or even you know, sort of engage with somebody who looks like me, but they may listen to you. They may listen to somebody else in your network. So you have access. You are now an ambassador to these various networks, to these different people in these networks, and you can convince them or you can at least uh, engage in conversation with them. You know, convincing, of course, as we said, you might not try to do that necessarily, but just at least try to share positive, personal, humanizing stories. Because right now there is an active effort to dehumanize Muslims and Islam. And every step that you can take to humanize to personalize uh, uh, Muslims and Islam, that is one step closer to helping counter the, the negative information out there. You are doing your part by helping share those positive messages that help humanize individuals, uh, com a community that as Terry mentioned, is only about one, maybe most estimates at most will go to 3% of the US population. And there's no way for everybody to have a Muslim best friend. Uh, so that's why we rely on our allies, on people like you to be the ambassadors, to be the speakers, to be the ones who help share some of these positive personal stories to counter the misinformation campaign, the hate campaign that exists out there. And I will close on this point that if you do not speak out, you know, remember uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, message, uh, and it goes, the quote is something like, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, not like the Islamophobia industry, not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So please do not be silent. Please make sure you understand how powerful and how necessary your voice is, especially in this time when we are so divided and when all of this misinformation is being uh, sort of promoted on social media and really growing in, in, in ugly ways and ways that can have long-term damage. Know that your voice, your pen, your words can have a true impact in changing the direction of our country, can help counter the, the, the hate out there and really promote a different narrative that saves the soul of our country.
country and helps emphasize so many of these freedoms uh, and liberties that we all take, uh, that we all cherish. So we want to do that together. We are in this together. We know that collectively our voices are so powerful and as much money as they may have, the haters may have, and as much a sort of misinformation as might be out there, we have the power of honesty and truth on our side. We have the power of love, which is far stronger than hate. We have the ability to unite in a way that counters uh, the, the divisions that our haters, that our opponents seek to promote. So let's let's build up on that. Let's do the sort of the, the work that we need to do and help ensure that our facts and our faith are far greater than the fear and the fear mongering out there. And I, and I would just like to add to that really, you know, always inspiring to hear you talk about, you know, the power of our collective work. And I, I began my conversation with all of you talking about Irvin Staub, talking about active bystanders, who if they act early in a process of dehumanization, can actually, can actually halt um, the process of dehumanization leading to violence. And that's all of us. If you want some resources to help you, we've got on our Facts Over Fear uh, Facebook page, all of our animated videos are there. Um, you can share them right from there. Um, we've got lots of memes that you can share as well. We have some additional videos there and you can go to ISPU's uh, Facebook page as well and, and share some of their uh, beautifully produced videos and other infographics, which can really be helpful. So thank you all for being a part of this and for continuing your journey to, to better stand with our American Muslim sisters and brothers. And remember that if you work on these skills, you can stand with other groups that are being dehumanized and, and also do that because all those dehumanizations are part of one like terrible matrix of fear. And if we can, if we can really reduce it toward American Muslims, we can reduce it a little bit for everyone. And remember that we are in this together. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.